Hello! Uh, thank you for clicking on this link. Um, I hope this video is helpful for you, and anyway, it'll be short. <laughs> um, this is a short video preview on kinesthetic activities in games for ESOL. Uh, my name is William Lin. Um, my email is right there, w-i-l-l-l at l-a-c-n-y-c dot o-r-g, and I am the ESOL specialist and coordinator of ESOL certificate programs at the Literacy Assistance Center um, here in New York City. And um, Let's see, if you'd like more information about these activities, um, then feel free to contact me. This is the purpose of this video. Um, you can also access my email address via the QR code right there, which will be floating around throughout the um, very short presentation. So uh, first of all, I just want to talk about why I'm doing this video on this topic of kinesthetic games and activities. Um, the basic reason is that I've taught plenty of ESL classes for adults that went until like 8 or 9 o'clock at night. And um, you need something to keep them awake, you know, <laughs> in order to be like a great teacher at that time of day, like students probably need to stand up and, and move around. Um, so um, that's one. Another thing that I would say is that um, I spent a lot of time as an ESL teacher, like searching for a new activity and a new activity and a new activity to like have my students be engaged. Um, and I've kind of stepped back from that because I found that like, if I can just find a good structure for an activity, then I can plug in different content and it's still fresh. Um, and then the other benefit is that students already kind of know how to do the activity and they don't have to learn it again. They don't get confused and it doesn't take up like a ton of class time to model the activity and so on because we've already used this familiar structure in other lessons. So that's the why. Um, Following from that, uh, I want to look at one very adaptable activity in this video um, and then talk about ways that you can adapt this very adaptable activity. <laughs> um, so here we go. Uh, this activity, I'm calling it side to side, there may be other names for it. In this case, um, students, S's right there, line up in the middle of the room facing the teacher. Uh, the teacher, T, asks a question with two options and students move to one side or the other to indicate their answer. Um, and then, if it's appropriate for the question, students can, you can discuss their answers as a class or have them turn to a partner and discuss their answer there. So here's a more concrete example of this. Um, and to get out of full screen mode, there we go. So let's say you're doing um, a lesson, a unit um, on health, and you're doing a lesson on like symptoms, vocabulary. Um, and uh, so this is what the classroom would kind of look like. Uh, the teacher would be somewhere up at the front, and uh, here on the board you can see um, move to that side uh, if you think you should go to the doctor, or move to that side if you think you should just stay home and rest. So the teacher says, um, I have a headache, and Maria says, oh, um, that's not too bad, like, you, you should just stay home, and she moves over there. And Lee thinks, uh... You know, headaches can be pretty bad, and I, like, I never get headaches, so if I had a headache, I would go to the doctor. So she moves over there. And Mo agrees with Lee, and so he goes over there. And um, then the te teacher can say, oh, uh, Maria, you move there, and Lee, you move there, and Mo. Um, why? Why do you think you should just stay home and rest? And then there can be a little discussion. Students move back to the center of the room, and then the teacher says the next uh, symptom, you know, I have a stomach ache. Um, and then students, again, make their decisions, whatever they are. All right. So, um, some adaptations of this, because uh, it is very ad adaptable, as I said. Um, you can do this with different content. Here's just a couple examples, a few examples of that. Um, you can have students move to, you can do count and non-count nouns, move to the left if it's count, move to the right if it's non-count. Um, pronunciation with minimal pairs. If students are working on the i and e sounds, um, you can have them move. You say rich, and like they move to the left for that, or you say reach, and they move to the right for that, and then you know ship, sheep, um, and you can also do this with um, as like a true false activity based on a reading. So if students like read a story, they read an article, then they stand up in the middle of the room, um, and you say, make some statement about the story or the article, um, and they would move to the left if it's true and to the right if it's false, for example. So you can see, I uh, just keep going with this. Um, 
If you change the structure of the activity a little bit, here's some examples. So you can have students that you can say the students that they can stay in the middle for like a third option. So if uh, you want to add, you know, it depends, <laughs> not just like yes or no, but like it depends. Um, you could have them stay in the middle for that. Um, or for multiple choice, like A, B, C, you know, uh, A could be one side, B in the middle, and C on the other side, something like that. Um, you can expand it to corners of the room if you want to have uh, four options. And I've seen that used in um, uh, like GED classes for debates, um, if there's more nuance to the, to the topic. Um, and then if there's no space in your classroom to really like move around that much, um, you can have students stand and sit to indicate their answer. And, and there's still some movement in that. Um, so if that looks interesting to you and you'd like to know more about other activity ideas that I have, kinesthetic games and activities uh, that are very flexible, um, feel free to contact me. Uh, this is my email address here, uh, w-i-l-l-l -L -L at l-a-c-n-y-c dot o-r-g. Um, you can also, as I said, access my email via the QR code. And I hope this is helpful and I hope to hear from you soon. Thanks.